Hello and welcome to Lecture 59 of my class from Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your instructor, and this is a, well, an other topics lecture. That means we got a couple of things to talk about that didn't quite fit into any of our other topics. I need to throw them in at the end, uh, so this is other regression topics. The two topics are going to be indicator variables and nonlinear regression, completely unrelated to each other, but just sticking them together to cover all the things I wanted to cover before we finish our, our basic set of lectures on how to do regressions. So indicator variables are important ways of dealing with categorical variables. Categorical or qualitative variables um, are variables that, that uh, can be expressed as belonging to certain discrete, non-overlapping categories. For example, did the sample receive a certain treatment? Yes or no? That's a simple one. Which tool was used to perform the process? Maybe there's tools A and B. Maybe there's tools A, B, or C. And, but it's only one of the three. What material was this part made from? Maybe we're doing a model, like we talked about in the last uh, lecture on the yield of a manufacturing process and maybe one of the components of that process is made from material A or from material B and we want to know the choice of that material effect, uh, the reliability of that part or the yield of that part or something like that. So indicator variables are binary. They only take on values of 0 or 1. It could be zero or two or, or minus four and, and plus six, but you know, uh, has to be two separate values. And zero and one makes the interpretation far easier than uh, anything else. Sometimes people use minus one and plus one, but in general, zero and one makes uh, interpretation of our modeling results much easier. So that's why we typically use indicator variables as zero or one. For example, x2 might be a regression variable that we're going to use in our model. X2 will have a value of 0 if the observation is from tool A, and we'll have a value of 1 if the observation is from tool B. Then we stick X2 in the model. Any coefficient of X2 other than 0 would say that the tool is significant, whether it's tool A or tool B makes a difference in our response. Uh, that's how we use this uh, idea. Uh, the coefficient would also give you an indication of the magnitude of the difference uh, of, of using tool A versus tool B. When we stick an indicator variable in our model, we do linear regression just like anything else. Uh, so this is just a technique for applying categorical variables into our model. Here's an example. I have an etch process. I'm, I'm etching away a certain amount of material, so the thickness of the material remaining is my response variable y. Uh, the etch, the thickness of material remaining, varies with time. That's what etching does. It removes material. Um, but I have two different etch tools, and I will use an indicator variable x2 to represent the etch tools. x1 will be time. So here's my model. Uh, the amount of material removed is um, b0 plus b1x1 plus b2x2 plus a random. Um, zero mean variable. For tool A, we'll say x2 is zero, in which case our model I had is beta zero plus beta one x1. For B, x2 is one, so our model is, well, just plug in one for x2, we get beta zero plus beta two as our intercept and beta one times x1. The result is uh, both of these cases, tool A and tool B, have the same slope, which slope will be our etch rate, but they have different intercepts. In other words, the, the model, I'm assuming in this model that I have two parallel lines. What does the intercept represent? Well, it's some kind of uh, induction effect. Maybe it, it takes a certain amount of time before the etching begins. Maybe you have a, a thin um, oxidized layer or some other uh, surface phenomenon makes the etch rate um, require some amount of time before it kicks off. And maybe that induction period, time period, uh, is different. And that can uh, be manifest as 
an effective uh, offset in the time or uh, as an effective offset in thickness. Now, suppose that I include interactions into this model. So I've added now an interaction term, x1 times x2. What does that interaction term represent when x2 is an indicator variable? I'll just look at the two cases. For tool A, I still have b0 plus b1 x1. For tool B, now I have a model with a different intercept and a different slope. Therefore, b2 tells me the change in intercept when going from tool A to tool B. And b3, beta 3, tells me the change in slope going from tool A to tool B. Well, maybe B2 is zero, uh, but I do get a change in slope. So maybe only the interaction term is significant. Notice that if I fit all of the data that I have for both tool A and tool B to this model with the indicator variable and the interaction term both, uh, I get the exact same result is if I were to separate the data into two groups, a tool A group and a tool B group, and fit two separate models, one for tool A and one for tool B. Same results. So you can do it either way. Uh, of course, if you have lots of different indicator variables going on, it's sometimes a lot more convenient to do everything at once than trying to fit lots and lots and lots of different individual models. Suppose I have more than uh, two levels for this category. Suppose I have three tools, for example, tool A, B, and C. Well, I can represent three tools using two indicator variables, so x2 and x3. If I, both of those variables equal zero, then I say the observation is from tool A. Right? This is kind of a table that helps me decode the meaning of my indicator variables, and you, you can choose how you set this up. If x2 is 1 and x3 is 0, I'll say that this is tool B. That's what my definition of these indicator variables will be. And if x2 is 0 and x3 is 1, then I say the observation is from tool C. Notice that as I set it up this way, only one indicator variable is turned on at a time. So when I model uh, either x2 or x3 or neither of them will show up but never both at the same time. Right? If both x2 and x3 were both one, that would mean those two, or two mathematical terms in the model would be adding together. Somehow they would be interacting with each other um, to add more response. But that doesn't make any sense since these are just individual tools. So I set up my indicator variables so that only one of them can be have a value of one at a time. And that's how I, I create multiple categories that are non-overlapping. Now, I think you can generalize. For A levels, you need A minus 1 binary indicator variables. It is a common mistake. If you, if you have three tools to set up three indicator variables, one for A, one for B, and one for C, but if you do that, you're making a big mistake. This mistake will result in perfect multicollinearity. Because there is a constraint, there's no possibility for um, all three to be zero at the same time. So uh, this multicollinearity will show up very, very quickly and easily if you use the same number of indicator variables as you have levels. Be sure to use the a minus one indicator variables. All right, let's change topics. Let's talk about nonlinear. <coughs> excuse me. Let's talk about nonlinear regression. Uh, we've talked about this before. We know the difference between linear and nonlinear regression. Linear regression means our model is linear in the coefficients. Nonlinear regression means it's not. So here's an example of a linear regression: a zero plus a linear model, beta zero plus beta one times log of x. Here's an example of a nonlinear model requiring nonlinear regression. Y hat equals beta 0 e to the beta 1x. I'm linear in beta 0, but I'm nonlinear beta 1. So how can we find the best fit coefficients for a model like this? Obviously, these kinds of models uh, can and are 
used frequently because that's the way the world is working and we need a model that works that way as well. Well, we have to use some special iterative techniques to find the best fit coefficients. This produces problems. In particular, it produces a problem of the difference between local minima and global minima. If we're trying to minimize the, the uh, sum of the squares of the residuals, for example, we might find a local minima that's not a global minima. Sometimes, because of this, the solution that depends on our initial guess. We're, we, we start with a guess and we iterate until we find what we think is the best. But uh, the convergence towards that best can be slow, and in fact, may not converge at all if we're not careful, depending on the mathematical techniques used. So it can be very difficult to do nonlinear regression. But nonlinear regression models happen all the time. They show up all the time in science and engineering. Here's uh, just a couple examples I grabbed out of the literature. Uh, Alice Menten model for enzyme kinetics, the model that you find in many kinetic uh, for, um, processes. Where we say the rate at which a reaction occurs uh, varies with the concentration of the reactant this way. So you see that it's nonlinear in the coefficients. Logistic growth model, um, commonly used for populations where there's some limit, some max population called the carrying capacity. And uh, this would show how the population varies with time. R. These are nonlinear models. Data to these models requires nonlinear regression. Sometimes, though, we can fix the nonlinear by transforming our expression to a linear expression. So suppose I have this simple exponential. One way to transform it is to simply take the log of the equation. I take the log of the equation, and now I fit this function to a, um, a, a model. So I transform the y, and then I do linear regression. Right? Well, this requires me to decide uh, what the distribution of the residuals should be of the transformed model. So if I want to use ordinary least squares regression, then I have to assume that the log of, of y is normally distributed. If, however, I can use generalized linear modeling, like we discussed in the last lecture, this would be log link. And then I could supply some other distribution. Could be a normal distribution. Could be a different distribution for, for y itself. So sometimes we can convert it to a linear model and use ordinary least squares regression. Sometimes we can convert it to a linear model and use generalized linear modeling. Sometimes we can't convert it to a linear model. There are some models where we simply can't solve uh, in such a way that we have a response as a linear function of coefficients of predictor variables. Um, just not possible. And in that case, we have no choice but to use nonlinear how does that work? Um, I'll, I'll explain one particular uh, algorithm approach uh, that is used called the Levenberg Marquat. One of the more popular ones. It's not the only one. There's a few others as well. The idea here is um, we're going to use, we're going to try to minimize the squares, the sum of the squares of the residuals, just like we always do. Minimize chi square. Um, so we'll start by taking the gradient, start at an initial guess for all of my parameters, then take the gradient and find the direction where chi-squared is declining the fastest. Uh, ideally, we can take these derivatives analytically for our given formula. And then, or we could do it numerically if not. But then we have a direction where chi-squared is declining fast. So we iterate our guess in that direction. The question is, how far do you jump? Right? How far do you move in that direction? If we take small steps, then we get to our answer very, very slowly. Uh, if we take big steps, we might actually jump over uh, a, a minimum or jump over the some very dramatic change in the slope. So another approach 
is to take a Taylor series kind of idea. That is, we assume that near the minimum, uh, the behavior of our function, no matter what it is, looks like a second order. It looks like a parabola. Uh, this is only reasonable when we're near the minimum. If we know the shape looks like a parabola, we can jump straight to the minimum. So the levenberg marquardt method combines these two approaches. We start by using uh, steepest descent, and then we switch to Taylor series approach, jump as fast as we can to minimum. The problem with this technique is the problem with all of these iterative uh, nonlinear least squares methods. We may get caught in a local minima, and that depends on our starting position, our initial guess. Uh, and it, it's, really, it's really hard to find and be guaranteed to find the global optimum for all of these cases. Well, there's, as I said, many other techniques we can use for nonlinear regression. I'm not going to go into the details. Just be aware that they are out there. So what have we learned in Lecture 59? Please answer these questions. What is an indicator variable, and how is it used in regression? If I have a categorical variable with four levels, how many indicator variables are, requ are required to represent it? And finally, what are the problems with nonlinear regression? Well, that's it for regression. We're going to start talking more generally about model building, regression being one of the tools we use. Till then.